Okay, I'm going to change gears for just a minute and um, talk about how depolarization and contraction occurs in cardiac muscle cells. So we're going to go back to thinking about cardiac muscle cells and cardiac muscle tissue. And this will harken back to the membrane potential stuff that we did and the skeletal muscle contraction stuff that we did. So first, um, just a couple of things before we get into the two different types of cardiac muscle cells. Um, cardiac muscle cells do secrete a hormone. Some cardiac muscle cells do. And I know you want to know another hormone. Um, this hormone is called ANF or sometimes ANP. And that stands for atrial which is where it's primarily released from, natriuretic, listen to that because it kind of gives you an inkling about what it might do, factor or atri atrial natriuretic peptide. It is released in response to atrial wall stretching. So if your atrial wall are continually getting stretched, this is going to be released and it targets the kidney. Okay, so instead of memorizing, let's think this one through for just a second. So um, could prolonged atrial wall stretching have anything to do with blood pressure? And if it did, would it be a signal of high blood pressure or low blood pressure? So think about that. Prolonged atrial wall stretching would be potentially a symptom of high blood pressure. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we detected that and released a hormone to go to the kidney, what should it target the kidney to do if you were thinking about negative feedback inhibition? It should target the kidney to decrease blood pressure. Good? Okay. So that's, and we'll do more on that one later. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit about cardiac muscle metabolism. Cardiac muscle is really not very particular in the nutrients that it wants to burn because it can burn glucose, other sugars, can also burn fatty acids, can burn lactic acid, all of that for energy. So getting nutrients is not generally a problem for cardiac muscle, but cardiac muscle has almost zero capacity to do anaerobic cellular respiration. So it really needs a constant supply of ox oxygen. It is intolerant of ischemia. You guys probably know that. If you cut off blood supply, oxygen supply to cardiac muscle for any appreciable length of time, then the cells will die and they tend to be amitotic. So that's a big problem. Okay, so now what I wanna get into is the whole idea of these pacemaker cells in cardiac muscle and then the contractile cells in cardiac muscle, how they're similar, how they're different from one another. So first, let's talk about the presence of pacemaker cells in cardiac muscle. So you've kind of learned this before, but um, should have learned it in anatomy. Um, within cardiac muscles, um, there are the contractile cells that are typical cardiac muscle contractile cells with actin and myosin and, you know, the ability to do cross bridge cycling. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. But there is also within cardiac muscles, um, about 1% of the cells that can generate their own spontaneous action potentials. And these are called pacemaker cells. And the two biggest chunks of them are at the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. But then, not shown in this picture, you also have the AV bundle, the left and right bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. Those cells are um, either called pacemaker cells or just because you might run into it in the future. Sometimes they're called autorhythmic cells, as in generating their own rhythm, conducting cells, as in they are the boss of the orchestra, or sometimes nodal cells. And really what happened during um, embryonic development is they lost their um, capacity to contract or didn't develop their capacity to contract and instead specialized to transmit impulses and propagate, propagate them to their neighbors via gap junctions. So what they have is they have a whole bunch of specialized channels on the surface and some pumps too. 
And then they also have a whole bunch of gap junctions and they are connected in networks that will allow cells to communicate with one another. So these are pacemaker cells that we're talking about. And remember that cardiac muscle has these intercalated discs between the cells and at the intercalated discs, in addition to desmosomes for strength, they also have gap junctions for communication. So this is a diagram of like an intercalate or a, um, an intercalated disc with desmosomes and gap junctions. Um, okay, so um, they allow them to communicate to other cells via gap junctions. Now, I would like to highly, highly recommend that you do this interactive physiology, um, interactive activity. So if you click on this guy right here, hopefully it'll work for you. It's supposed to be only with a paid textbook, but so there's learning goals, what you need to know. And then the green things are things that you actually have to do. And then there's little like two minute to four minute videos in between. It's really good practice because a lot of you guys are really kinesthetic and doing something really helps get it into your brain. So I would recommend that you go through this for the electrical activity of the heart. Okay. so. I want to talk about the process of generating an action potential in pacemaker cells. How do these cells, like the SA node, little blob of cells, how do they generate an action potential and then what do they do with it when they have generated an action potential? So the process of generating an action potential in pacemaker cardiac muscle cells. So first thing is um, to look at this graph. Um, which will introduce us to pacemaker action potentials um, and also a little bit to membrane potentials and cardiac muscle cells. So um, pacemaker cells have what we call a variable resting membrane potential, meaning that the resting membrane potential really never stays at rest. It's about minus 60, but it's going to immediately start depolarizing to threshold again as soon as you re reset it back to minus 60 and then repolarize and then repolarize. So a variable resting membrane potential around minus 60. But what happens is these particular cells, these guys right here, these pacemaker cells in the SA node, for instance, um, have... Um, a type of channel that you don't find in other places. And um, it's really kind of like a sodium leak channel that counterintuitively is a leak channel that's not always open. So just go with me. They call them funny channels because they're kind of like leak channels and kind of not. But what they are is there's a dependable number of these sodium funny channels and a dependable sodium electrochemical gradient because we work really hard on that and we know that. Since there's a dependable um, number of sodium leak channels, funny channels, and a dependable electrochemical gradient for sodium, then as soon as you repolarize, you're going to start depolarizing again and depolarizing again and depolarizing again, which is what you're seeing here. So sodium will leak in slowly through these funny channels. Keep your potassium channels closed at this stage. Um, and then you'll have an action potential when you hit threshold, which depending on textbook you, you look at is either minus 40, minus 50, somewhere around that in cardiac muscle cells. At threshold, what happens here, importantly, is you will open a new kind of channel that you haven't met in cardiac muscle yet. It is a fast voltage gated calcium channel and calcium is positive ion and its electrochemical gradient makes it want to move into the cardiac muscle cell. When it moves in, of course, it will cause this rapid depolarization. Okay. So fast voltage gated calcium channel, calcium rushes in from the extracellular fluid. And then um, contraction does not follow in these cells importantly. So we've got a whole bunch of sodium and a whole bunch of calcium in here. What am I going to do with that sodium and calcium? Well, some of it I'm going to put back where I got it. Give it. I'll do that in just a second. But a lot of it, remember, what I want to do is I want to send it to my neighbors to depolarize my neighbors. So I let a whole bunch of sodium and calcium in. I'm going to send most of it through gap junctions to depolarize my neighbors. Okay. Whatever I didn't send through the gap junctions, I am going to, with repolarization, put everything back where I got it. So how am I going to repolarize? Well, it won't be any big surprise to you. How am I going to get back from here after I just let a whole bunch of sodium and calcium in, okay, passed a bunch of it off to my neighbors. What am I going to do to get back to my variable resting membrane potential of 60-ish? Uh, I'm going to close whatever channels were still open 
okay? And then I am going to open a potassium channel, right? Open potassium channels to repolarize. Um, I'm going to use sodium and potassium pumps, but I'm also going to need a calcium pump to pump it back into the extracellular fluid, whatever was still in the intracellular fluid. So where does it all go? A whole bunch of sodium and calcium goes to my neighbors so I can depolarize them because that was the point, okay? Then I'm going to close the channels that were still open here, open potassium channels, and then pump everything back where I got it, sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. So let's do that on this one. We're supposed to label on this figure one below, sodium channel, calcium channel, and potassium channel activity. So let's do that. Okay. Come on. Okay, so um, what kind of channel is going on right here, guys? What kind of channel is that? That is a sodium funny channel. I don't really think they're that funny. Okay, what kind of channel is going on right here? That is an open voltage gated calcium channel. And it's the fast one. We'll meet a slow one soon. Okay, what happens here? Close calcium, open potassium. These are voltage gated potassium channels. Okay, so that's kind of, I hope, what you would have expected um, as far as the repolarization process. Okay, so um, now, so since the um, pacemaker cells actually do this job on their own, what does the autonomic nervous system do for them? And we're going to get into this in more detail in just a little bit. But um, the pacemaker cells do depolarize on their own and they do cause action potentials on their own. And the SA node does it about 100 times per minute. The SA node is the fastest pacemaker cell in a healthy heart. AV node uh, depolarizes more slowly. So since the SA node can do it on its own, what does the autonomic nervous system have to do with this? Well, you kind of already know, but let's just put it into context here and talk. Oh, there's a figure I want to open for you. I'll show it to you in just a second. So um, the rate of excitation and contraction in pacemaker cells is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So um, the sympathetic fibers, that's these coming from the thoracic region of the spinal cord, go to the SA node and the AV node, okay? And what would happen in this particular instance is, let me go ahead and I'll draw that in green. What would happen in this particular instance is, if um, I was already on my way at the SA node, for instance, to an action potential, and this was what it was doing at rest in this pink picture right here, what would happen if um, the sympathetic nervous system actually said, I know you're already depolarizing, but I am going to release norepinephrine, which will make you depolarize more quickly. What would happen is over the same time period, I would do it more frequently. So that's what you're seeing happening right here with the sympathetic nervous system. With the parasympathetic nervous system, which is represented in purple right there, what would happen is you would be on your way to an action potential in pink here, minding your own business. And then the parasympathetic nervous system would release acetylcholine, which would slightly hyperpolarize, so it would slow you down. And so instead of hitting an action potential when you were supposed to, you would hit it more slowly, right? That was what That's what the purple would do. So the rate of excitation contraction um, in pacemaker cells is controlled partially by the autonomic nervous system because it's already doing its own thing, but the autonomic nervous system can say, hey, I know you're about to have an action potential, but the sympathetic nervous system wants you to have one now. And it will depolarize when you are already on your way to depolarization or 
um, the parasympathetic nervous system could say, hey, I know you thought you were going to have an action potential, but how about I hyperpolarize you and slow you down? So that is the relationship between those two. Okay. So there is another interactive physiology video here for you. I would highly recommend using that. And then we'll do contractile cells in the next video.